I'm going to talk about hypogonadism in men with type 2 diabetes and focus on the clinical aspects which are relevant as far as the management dilemmas are concerned. So my talk will have four aspects. I'll talk about the background of it. I'll give you a clinical scenario. We'll go through the management approach. And then briefly, I'll talk about the testosterone replacement therapy and impact on CV health. So before I say anything, if I ask you, think about testosterone, close your eyes for five seconds. What do you think? What comes to your mind when you think about testosterone? I love anyone to participate in, in it and give me an answer. Whatever thoughts come to your mind if you think about testosterone. And I'm not asking about clinical thoughts, but what do you associate this hormone with? Dr. Rikin Shah is going to give it a go. Yes, sir. I think uh, we all have first person of testosterone sex hormone, sir. Right. Okay. So what comes to my mind when I think about testosterone, uh, Rikin, is it's, aggression. It's our, our male person. And um, the socio-cultural impact of testosterone. And, you know, to say it in a lighter sense, women call almost all the shot. And I can only see men in my screen um, shot in here. There is no woman presence, no estrogen, mostly testosterone. Um, we men assume it's we who are calling the shot. I can't even call shots at my own home. Um, so... Testosterone wants us to do things we don't really need to do anymore in order to survive. So I just wanted to give you a socio-cultural impact of testosterone. Probably it's not as useful hormone as we assume. When I ask my endocrine trainee students, name two most important hormones after cortisol, some of the boys answer is testosterone. We don't need testosterone to survive in that sense. So anyways, leave apart the lighter part of it. Let's move on to a clinical scenario. Um, a middle-aged man comes into your clinic. He has background of type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia. He's on standard medication. He's got element of central obesity. And when he comes to your clinic, he complains of low libido and low energy levels. So I'm sure many of us will correlate with this kind of clinical scenarios. We may have faced similar kind of patients. Some of the time you have to dip, dig deep enough, explore the symptoms. And it's not uncommon for men with diabetes and metabolic syndrome to complain of low energy levels. So my question here is, how do we investigate this patient further? And as I said, the standard protocol remains checking the testosterone level, fasting testosterone level, at least on two separate mornings. And let's assume these were the results. What should be our approach and management? So. Um, Middle-aged man with metabolic syndrome complains of low energy levels. Testosterone levels are low. What are the things which we need to keep in mind? As I said, it's a webinar and in a webinar, it seems we talk to a wall rather than to audience. And prior to the webinar, such individuals were called lunatics who were talking to their own self. Now talking to walls is deemed as giving a webinar. So anyways, I'm, I missed the face-to-face -face interaction and I'm sure Banshi will be able to organize a massive face-to-face -face meeting next year. So till then, I'll talk to the wall. So um, the context of hypogonadism and type 2 diabetes is extremely important. If you look at the epidemiological study, 25 to 40 percent of men with type 2 diabetes and or metabolic syndrome have hypogonadism. Erectile dysfunction and low testosterone level, 
these are the surrogate marker of cardiovascular health in men so it's if if a man with type 2 diabetes comes to my clinic and complains of erectile dysfunction i can assume there is issue with cardiovascular health now my checklist for investigation for such patient is very simplistic all i need to find out is is it a primary gonadal failure or secondary gonadal failure look for any reversible factor or etiology and then think about low testosterone and cvd as a cause or effect very simplistic life remains simple if we follow simple algorithms and i think this is in a nutshell what i would have done for such a patient now the question is are we going to investigate every patient with hypogonadism which answer is right but some of the symptoms or signs which are predominant in such individual include reduced libido erectile dysfunction increased sweating on sign aspects gynecomastia relatively late sign um unaccounted low hematocrit or male osteoporosis in the convention that we need to do a 9 am fasting testosterone check the gonadotrophin and the prolactin level because high prolactin remains a reversible factor for hypogonadism divide it into primary versus secondary hypogonadism the commonest reason for primary gonadal failure in clinical practice remains Klinefelter syndrome, which apparently they say one in four hundred to one in five hundred men may have it and may not present with the classical feature which we associate with Klinefelter syndrome. I've, the oldest patient with Klinefelter syndrome I have come across was in his mid sixties, happily married, no issue, not having classical features. But again, when we investigated with karyotype, it turned out to be Klinefelter syndrome. i need to focus on the secondary hypogonadism part of it and the common reasons for it in clinical practice remain anabolic steroid use opioid and undergoes further investigations prolactin iron studies which exclude hemochromatosis are normal it's fulfilling the criteria for hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism biochemically the next question is what are the next set of investigation you like to do for such an individual as i said because in a webinar i don't have a live audience i'm talking to a wall it's better for me to give my own answers um this is a question about the radiological investigation of secondary hypogonadism which has haunted me for few years now and if i go by the endocrine society guidelines that men with hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism if they've got clinical or biochemical evidence of hypopituitarism or low testosterone of less than 5.2 nanomole per liter need radiological investigations so based on it um it was Six or seven years ago, we identified 126 patients with secondary hypogonadism under my health board. We did a retrospective evaluation of their case notes and presented our results in European Congress of Endocrinology in Munich, May 2016. This was pre-COVID time when face-to-face -face meetings were the norm. We are waiting for the days to restart. Two years have been very difficult. So. out of those 126 patients i had under our follow up erectile dysfunction and reduced libido were seen in a significant proportion the key thing was that we carried out mri in 67 out of these 126 patients and none of the men with bmi over 30 kg per meter square with no evidence of clinical and biochemical feature of pituitary dysfunction had pitch tree adenoma so we put in huge amount of resources carrying out mri when 
in a sense, these individuals had what we call as non-gonadal illness or non-organic reason for their hypogonadism. So what I wanted to focus on the first part of my talk was giving you a clinical scenario of a type 2 diabetic man with metabolic syndrome having secondary hypogonadism and how much investigations are consumed investigating it. And I think in at least the patch I work in, this is getting more common. Now, testosterone replacement therapy, does it make any sense in such individuals? So I'll briefly go through the physiological rationale for it, share data from some observational study and then RCT and then go through briefly the position statement or the guidelines from the endocrine society. So physiology doesn't interest people on a Saturday afternoon. It must be midday post lunch. Your, you know, the sleep inducing hormones are at highest. I wasn't very good in physiology, especially around afternoon lectures, so I shouldn't consume much time here. All I can say that there is an inverse correlation between obesity and testosterone level. Testosterone levels correlate with insulin sensitivity. And we do know that decreased testosterone can impair the mitochondrial function. How does the testosterone replacement therapy have an impact on glucose metabolism? It does improve GLUT4 receptor expression and reduce insulin sensitivity. And based on the TIMES 2 and the BLAST study, we do know that um, symptomatic hypogonadal men with testosterone replacement, there is an improvement in some of the metabolic parameters. As I said, I'll not take too much time going into the details of these observational studies. Uh, there are some meta-analysis, uh, Rona G et al. in 2014, Bang et al. in 2014, and I published a uh, systematic review in British Journal of Diabetes back in December 2018, in which we noted there was an increase all cause mortality and CV events in men with low endogenous testosterone level. Protective effect of testosterone replacement therapy on all cause mortality and major adverse cardiovascular events seen in hypogonadal men with type 2 diabetes. The only caveat I want to throw in here is that we need to use testosterone replacement therapy cautiously in elderly men who had multiple comorbidities. So it's easier to use testosterone replacement therapy in men with organic cause for hypogonadism, but younger men with type 2 diabetes plus minus metabolic syndrome do benefit from testosterone replacement therapy as far as the cardiovascular system is concerned. So as I said, I wanted to keep everything quite brief. I was given around 20 minutes and my aim was to finish everything within 15 minutes. If I have to sum up everything, hypogonadism is quite common in men with type two diabetes and obesity. In such individuals, we need to focus on reducing cardiovascular risk factors and improving glycemic control. Losing body weight by around 10% increases the testosterone level by around three nanogram per deciliter. But we do know it's challenging to lose weight to that extent. Last, not the least, testosterone replacement therapy can be used in symptomatic hypogonadal type two men who have low fasting testosterone level. But please do make sure you rule out reversible factors such as high prolactin, exclude hemochromatosis, and um, think about other um, iatrogenic factors like opioids and anabolic steroids. Thank you.